Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, November Board of Estimate Taxation meeting. Uh, I'd like to start with the call to order and salute to the flag of our country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everyone, members and guests. Good to see everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. It is the season. Uh, our routine applications come first, and I will call on Mr. Drake, our clerk. Yes, we have one routine application. It's HD3 from the Health Department in the amount of $73,462, which is an approval to use various items. I'll second that motion. Moved by Mr. Drake, seconded by Mr. Johnson. Any discussion on that? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining. 12 0 0. This brings us to item number three non routine applications. And the first item I will call on Mr. Johnson on behalf of the Budget Committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move ED2 from the Board of Education. Uh, release of conditions of $2,759,000. Items have been moved, seconded by Mr. Mrs. Mrs. Seconded by? Me. Mr. Raymer. Discussion or committee reports first, I should say. Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the uh, Budget Committee met last week uh, to review this, this submission. Uh, Joe Ross, head of the Building Committee, uh, appeared before us. Uh, gave us an update on the progress. Uh, mentioned that uh, MISA is about 53% completed. Uh, the money requested is actually broken up into two different areas. Um, 1415000 is, um, uh, we had conditions on, on contingency funds for MISA. Um, I'll actually read the, uh, the, the subject to release. Subject to release upon acceptance of a plan that addresses MISA construction issues and cost proposals to finish the first phase of the auditorium's concrete for the orchestra pit and concrete for the floor and seating. Um, the second uh, amount of money is one million three hundred forty-four thousand, which the BET commission, uh, excuse me, conditioned um, for furniture, fixtures, and equipment uh, within the MISA project. Um, we actually were waiting for bids on those items. Um, they have been received, and the uh, the cost estimates. Um, 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 as I say, have been received and they can be uh, purchased under existing contracts uh, and with the existing suppliers. Um, among this uh, 1.34 million is money for uh, the sound system, acoustical panels, security equipment, and furniture within the uh, the auditorium. The committee voted 4-0 to approve this request. Zero. Discussion on this item? Okay. All that's a different piece of discussion than I remember. <laughs> All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? That motion is carried 12 0. <laughs> Item <laughs> Joe Ross, don't take that as a hint that we don't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> that, that brings us to NW1, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move NW1. Um, for Nathaniel Witherall, $100,000 additional appropriation for um, technology. Item has been moved and seconded by Mr. Raymer. Uh, committee report. Um, the budget committee heard from Alan Brown, Ray Augustine, <coughs> excuse me, Ray Augustine, and David Ormsby. Um, they appeared before the committee to request additional funds in the current fiscal year 15 budget for these security upgrades which include uh, closed circuit TV, uh, secure doors, and entry cards, and among a number of other items. The Budget Committee did express concern that a major department was requesting funds for a capital project outside the annual CIP and budgeting process. Um, it does appear that the uh, security upgrades are needed. Uh, we had no questions about the, uh, the importance of those. Um, uh, the committee and Nathaniel Witherall staff did agree to um, look at, or we, uh, I'm sorry, let me start over again here. The, the committee reviewed this with the staff, and um, um, Nathaniel Witherall recommended accepting the additional 
or we, we recommend accepting the additional appropriations, but within a condition that uh, it be, be paid for out of expected funds from a steep grant program. Uh, and I believe a, an item was passed to us here where the, uh, the request form has been amended to indicate that it is $100,000 coming from a steep grant. Um, so the committee voted 4-0 for that. Um, Mr. Chairman, and while I have the microphone, I, I would like to make a quick comment that um, we also met with the, the people from Nathaniel Witherall to, um, to hear more about their operating budget um, as of five months through the fiscal year. Um, while the year-to-day revenues um, are down due to delays within the project renew and, and getting uh, the rooms filled up, it does appear that um, um, the recent monthly trends exceed their expectations for the facilities. Um, so hopefully they're online to uh, getting to the point where they had planned to be within the plan itself. So we were happy to hear that progress. Um, we also got a glimpse into the 15-year capital plan. Um, uh, it was certainly uh, worthwhile to go through with the people from Nathaniel Witherall to uh, kind of see what they're planning for over the next uh, number of years. Um, anyway, for the additional appropriation, as I said, the committee did vote 4-0. Thank you. And then no other committees looked at this discussion on the item. So Nathaniel Willis has come a long way, and this item will be moving to the RTM, right, Peter? This has to go to the RTM, this item? Yes. So I would say to the Nathaniel Witherell family that's here, um, you know, you're going to probably be expected to at least hit the Finance Committee, and I don't know what other committee, Health and Human Services may look at that. Um, and, you know, we wanted to be very clear that the only reason that we approve this is because Ray Augustine is staying with us for another 10 years. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was reading the wrong notes. Um, <laughs> um, but again, I just thought that I would make that comment. Good luck. When are you, when are you with us till? 20th Oh, that's good. So we can move all the budget meetings up till the 18th or 19th. <laughs> Again, thank you, obviously, for all of your great service. Okay, moving along. Any other comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? That item is carried. Moves us to item number four, assessor's report. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you voting on the conditions separately? I thought the item had the condition that it was to be paid out of the steep funds. Yeah, and we have a new form that says that. Yeah. So the motion as passed, as I understood it, was to be paid. Um, we did. We did put a condition in there to um, that it be paid for out of the expected funds from a steep grant program. So I believe the intent of that was to go through the comptroller's office or the finance department once those funds uh, were received from the steep. Right. And it's in the, the revised yeah. sheet that we have here. And there's also a separate resolution in the packet. Uh, with a historic tax credit resolution. Nathaniel Witherell condition for NW1. So, so I'll move the condition. The $100,000 additional appropriation for the security upgrade to Nathaniel Witherell is subject to receive a steep grant fund and evidence of the front grant funds can be used for the purpose of this appropriation. Second. Moved by Ms. Tarkington, seconded by Mr. Finger. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? Thank you, Roland. Thank you very much. Good catch. Okay, moving on. Assessor's report. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the BET. Um, I'd like to present the assessor's report for November 2014. Um, just a couple of things I'd like to mention. First of all, we are down to 38 court cases. Hopefully we'll be down a few more by next December. And basically it's just work as our normal workload. We are currently finalizing the 2014 grand list, which um, is to be completed as planned by the end of January. Anybody have any questions? Hang on, let me just write one. Again, congratulations as you keep bringing down the number of pending yes. cases. Yeah. <laughs> what, what did we start at there? Well, when? 167. When I came, we had 
when I came, Seven. yeah, but then we since I've came come, we've added a few more. But we basically 167, and so we have 38 left. Wow. Were you successful today at all? With nope. all? <laughs> We're over three today. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, can I get a motion that the accessors report be accepted? Mis moved by Mr. Finger, seconded by Ms. Tarkington. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Controller's report. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, BET members. Uh, two or three quick points on the controllers before, before I open it up for questions. The, um, we expect uh, for year end closing, page one, we expect the draft of the audit to be completed this week. And um, Chairman Art Norton of the BET Audit Committee has called for a special meeting November 25th at 10 o'clock to cover the uh, draft of the uh, CAFR ending June 30th, 2014. In addition, we expect to have the report completed for the certification of costs for the historic tax credits to be covered at that meeting. And uh, Wayne Fox and his office has completed the uh, legal letter and we'll be discussing that with the auditors, which is a confidential document, and that will be covered also at the special meeting on February, I'm sorry, on November um, 25th, next Tuesday. Uh, just received the financing schedule for the borrowing in January. Didn't have a chance to put it into the uh, controller's report, but as soon as the draft has is, is been proofread, I'm going to be swinging right into uh, putting the official statement together. And um, we expect to go to market with a bond sale and a note sale uh, January 15th with the credit reviews the week of January 5th through 9th. Uh, one final comment. Uh, in the uh, um, controller's report, it made mention that the actuary report was approved by the Retirement Board. Uh, there's, uh, Boomer Shine does two actuary reports, one for the Retirement Board, which was approved by the Retirement Board in the, at their meeting last month. The OPEB report is not completed. and what we uh, wanted to do uh, with permission from the chairmen of the BET and the, uh, of the chairman of the uh, budget committee is when the second one is available in December, I'd like to have the actuary come in. The options you have, uh, because they're pretty important, uh, the, the, uh, if you notice in the controller's report, the ARC came down even though we moved the assumption, uh, interest rate assumption from seven and a quarter to seven. Also, there's impact on the ARC for the OPEB that needs to be discussed. The options are he can come in in January at a night meeting and discuss it before the Budget Committee or the BET. What's probably preferable is to come in in February, and he can give a presentation if you block out an hour or so in February, and then you can vote on it then. It's more applicable or more appropriate to discuss it be refreshing your time because it's important on what you're voting on as far as the ARC for both of them. So, and I don't want to get into the details because I haven't seen the, uh, the, the, uh, the tentative or preliminary arc for the OPEP fund right now. So, Mike, just on a quick question, we have to, by charter, we have a certain date that we have to agree or disagree to the assumed rate of return. When is that? No, no, I, I, I we do that the in only December. charter requirement, I could be wrong, but the only charter requirement is, is the retirement board has to prove it by December 5th okay. and make their recommendation. We, we have never, uh, in my 11 years here, to my, it's, the BET has never voted on a, uh, an actual report before December. Okay. And last year, it really slipped with the change of uh, vendors, and it was really late. Yes, I remember. Recall. That's probably what's messing so me up. So this is the earliest is the retirement actual report has ever been done. And the OPEB uh, report, it was not a priority at the time because it didn't have the charter requirement to be passed by the retirement board by December 1st. Okay. So it's, it's, I mean, okay. my recommendation is, well, it's fresh in mind, either have your presentation, his presentation to you in, either, in January or February. Okay. Don't need to decide tonight. So I'll open it up to any questions in the uh, controller's report. Question? Yes. Pete, just a quick question on the um, strategy that you were working with the treasurer about uh, for 10 million in cash and laddering that up a bit. Is that in place now or is that no. still being worked it, on? Uh, we, it kind of, it kind of fell through the cracks because of the added pressure on my staff for the ADP payroll implementation. It actually nudged out the cash forecasting and we're, 
the treasurer in, in my office was going to wa uh, work with uh, Bill Drake. It slipped for this month. Uh, if, 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 if permissible, we want to come to you next month. And I, I'm going to defer to uh, the Investment Advisory Committee. It, it just slipped because of all, my budget director and my treasurer got prioritized as far as implementing the ADP. And it, uh, we didn't have time. We were almost ready, but we're going to shoot for December. I have a motion to accept the controller's report for Second. November. Second. Moved by Mr. Norton, seconded by Ms. Tarkington. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? 1200. Item number six, treasurer's report. To accept that, Mr. Chairman? I have a motion by Mr. Norton Second. to accept, seconded by Ms. Tarkington. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? BET Standing Committee Reports. Uh, Mr. Raymer, I have law committee checked off. Is, is, do you have a report now or pertaining to an item? It only pertains, the only report I have would pertain to the investment in the landmark real estate fund. And so I'll make that report at that time. Thank you. Uh, BET Liaison Reports. Chairman, I will give an update on budget renewal. Okay. As I think everybody knows that the Building committee has a subcommittee which meets every Monday morning, and then the full building committee did meet this morning. And the expectation is that uh, by the end of this week, <clears throat> Turner will file for the certificate of occupancy. There is still one item outstanding. It has to do with some <clears throat> plans that we are requesting and have been prepared by uh, Tony DeAndre's office, which uh, have not been yet received, and subsequently. Uh, that's a, a potential obstacle until they are done, and if the uh, sewer department can, can sign off on it, uh, we can't proceed to the application or seeking a certificate of occupancy. Hopefully it will be done this week. Uh, the application and the walkthroughs will be done, and hopefully we get the certificate of occupancy uh, within the next two weeks. Should I just sort of just add that um, you know, the town has, continues to work closely with the Connecticut Deep and the EPA, um, together with our both our um, legal and environmental consultants, and the town is hopeful that the response from the regulatory agencies uh, will be received by year end. But um, that would be most helpful in terms of um, bidding out the project for next summer. But you know, one never knows, and. Um, what the regulators may require next. The Investment Advisory Committee for the first time there, approval of the landmark investment. Uh, and we have a motion here, uh, do we not? Let's see, we have a motion in our a resolution before us. I won't, I won't bother to read it unless you want me to. Uh, it's in the in the paper package that was handed out. Um, or maybe I'll briefly read it just so we know. Uh, this, uh, upon a motion duly made and sec seconded, the actually this is the law. All right, this is the law committee's resolution. All right, so I won't present it, but we're talking about the same thing. Uh, at its meeting on October 24th, the Investment Advisory Committee. Uh, considered and approved by a unanimous vote of four to nothing uh, the decision that the retirement board took to commit up to $15 million to invest in landmark real estate fund seven. And this is a follow up to previous investments with landmark in the equity uh, category. This landmark real estate fund invests in secondary real estate partnership interests. So for, as an example, an original investor like the city of Fort Worth or Los Angeles or Hartford has invested in various real estate funds and due to his change in strategy, they want to sell. So in contrast to those original investors who are investing up front without the knowledge of the underlying real estate properties into which they're investing, 
This, when Landmark invests here on a secondary basis on behalf of Greenwich, they have visibility into the underlying properties, the office buildings or malls or uh, whatever the underlying real estate investments that have been made. So in the opposite of being a blind pool, this is whatever you'd call the opposite of that, where you can see what you're investing in, which is a risk reduction uh, approach. Uh, the retirement board's consultant recommended this investment saying uh, that we believe, this is New England pension consultants, we believe that the secondary market is attractive because of the diversification benefits, the relatively early cash flow, the opportunity to acquire interests at a discount to reported values, and the increasing volume of secondary real estate transactions. Landmark has a strong reputation and is experienced in a well-connected buyer in the secondary market. Uh, the fund has the opportunity to invest opportunistically in special situations where when the previous investor wants to get out, that's an opportunity to buy interests on an advantageous basis. Um, Within this environment, Landmark's expertise in the secondary market allows it to capitalize on the compelling market opportunity. That's just the end of a little blurb from the report by New England Pension Consultants. So we had some questions posed by our committee and satisfactory answers given. And, and so our committee's vote was four to nothing in favor. The retirement board's vote was unanimously in favor of, of this investment. Thank you. Now I welcome you. Importantly, the bottom line, uh, though I have some other comments to make, the bottom line is that the Law Committee found the documentation on this investment to be in legal order by a vote of 2-0. Uh, we had, however, some concerns, and we debated for a while whether or not our concerns rose to a high enough level that we would actually um, uh, come back and opine instead that, no, we don't find things to be in legal order. We didn't get there. Uh, but the compromise position was to come back and report that things are in legal order and then express to you the seven concerns. There were concerns, uh, sheepishly, I have to admit, that largely came uh, from the uh, wise observation of, of my colleague, Mrs. Tarkington. Uh, but I'll report them as if they were my own and claim uh, uh, the authorship of them. Uh, let me share you with, with you what those concerns are. Frequently with these um, alternative investments, the documentation is a little vague or general about the strategy going forward because they have not yet identified the investment vehicles that they'd be investing in and they want to leave a certain latitude in the documents to make decisions as they go along. And so for an investor like the town of Greenwich, you're committing to a dollar figure. In this case, you're committing to a figure of up to $15 million. But there is certain nebulousness of exactly how that will that money be invested. In this particular case, we were focusing on the following concerns. First, the documentation talked about how there was an intent to mostly invest in secondary investments. Exactly as Mr. Drake described, when you invest in secondary investments, you have a vehicle that exists, it's already invested, it may have six months or a year, a year and a half of track record that you can look at uh, and uh, then make your decision about whether you wish to go ahead and take out the position that's being sold at that point, I don't know, by the Minneapolis Teachers Union Pension Fund or whatever it is who might be the seller. So to say to us only that there's an intent Tent to invest mostly in gave us the concern about whether or not you had clearly defined for you what were, what were going to be the subject of the investments, uh, and clearly there's an ambiguity about that. Secondly, the SEC is presently, as we speak, working its way through a process of trying to define at what point is a, is a vehicle a hedge fund and at what point is it private equity. Uh, it's still kind of an emerging, um, emerging field, regulations being promulgated and then revised and promulgated again. Um, uh, it's not unimportant to us that this be a private equity rather than a hedge fund because it does then enjoy at least some regulation. Um, and all that's being uh, expressed to us is that there's a current expectation by Landmark to adopt policies under which it would be defined by the SEC as being a private equity, not hedge fund. 
And then they go on to say that if that policy is adopted, then the following things would happen, and, it's, and it describes. I'm not mistrusting in any way the uh, bona fides of Landmark, but you have to understand the nature of the documents that you're accepting. The documents, if you're relying on the fact that this will be a private equity instead of a hedge fund, do understand that the documents are only are talking about an intention to adopt policy, not a guarantee or assurance. Thirdly, there was a question raised, again, by the absolutely clever observation of my colleague that the fund was capable, however unlikely, capable of an open-endedness. And as you looked at the documents, most particularly Section 2.2 of the Limited Partnership Agreement, indeed, I thought Mrs. Tarkington's observation was correct. The termination of this, of this uh, fund is said to occur on whatever is the latest, the latest, the last of the following three events. One, 10 years after the fund closes, meaning the final investors are in, all right, so a 10-year term plus a few months perhaps, or if later, then the point at which the fund has sold, liquidated all of its investments without there being any undertaking in the document about exactly when will that take. So the fund has an ability then to extend the term by simply not liquidating some of its investments or at least one of its investments. Or thirdly, again, the latest of, one-year extensions at the behest of the investment advisor concurred in by two-thirds of the invested value of the fund. If, we don't, if we're not part of that two-thirds investment, then this one-year extension can occur, and there's no limit on the one-year extensions. So however ridiculously unlikely it is to happen, the possibility exists for an endless succession of one-year extensions. And so it was hard to say that, in fact, I have a clear termination. There's another section in the Limited Partnership Agreement, 13, Section 13.1, which contains certain other terminating events, but it, too, doesn't contain an outer point at which the fund absolutely has to come to an end. Do I honestly think that this fund will be kept in perpetuity? No, I don't. Uh, and the expectation of everybody is, uh, everybody involved in it seems to be, that the term would be uh, 10 years or perhaps just a little bit more, but certainly not, not dramatically more than that, but that's not expressed in the documents. Uh, next, the documentation said that uh, no more than 30% of the vehicles of investment will be located outside of the United States and Canada. Uh, the question was then raised by Mrs. Tarkington, mm, of the 70%, how much is going to be in Canada and how much is going to be in the United States, and the documents are silent. In the response that Mr. Um, uh, Simon uh, sent back to us from, uh, from Landmark on that question, uh, they point out, again, their expectation of not to have any large exposure in Canada, and they cite to you what the investments were on funds one, two, four, five, and six, all of which were tiny, tiny, tiny percentages in Canada. My only observation in passing is they didn't happen to mention to us what happened with fund number three. I don't know why they gave us the figures on one, two, four, five, and six without mentioning three, but clearly the percentages in Canada uh, on funds one, two, four, five, and six are very, very small. The fifth observation is that if you go through all of the documentation, every single piece of the documentation, hold it up sideways, hold it up the light, nowhere is there an expression of the $15 million cap. Uh, that's easily solvable by um, our motion here tonight being an authorization for up to but not exceeding $15 million. But I would say to you in passing just the observation that, as Mrs. Tarkington pointed out, the $15 million ta cap is not expressed in the documentation. Number six, the, con yours? the concern, was that one mine? That was yours. I, I managed to have one, I'm glad. One of the seven were mine. Um, uh, uh, number six, the observation was the uh, documentation uh, promises that it will not make any acquisitions of these um, secondary purchases with more than 70% leverage. Uh, Mrs. Tarkenton raised the question of yes, but do the underlying packages that you're buying themselves, are they leveraged internally? And the very right observation, uh, the correct Direction from, um, uh, uh, from Landmark in the documentation forwarded to us by Mr. Simon is, no, there's a look-through provision here. The 70% is the aggregate of all of the leverage, including the internal leverage and the packages themselves. So all of your purchases will not have a cumulative leverage of more than 70%, and we are, in fact, protected on that.
There was a seventh one which, for whatever reason, Landmark didn't respond to, and that was the observation that we're paying the investment advisor a, a fee, and the fee is calculated to be 1% of the commitment undertaken by the town. But you issue a commitment, in our case the commitment is $15 million, you do not have an assurance that your commitment is going to be drawn down its full measure. So in the hypothetical in which your drawdown that's made available to you by the fund is only $5 million, if you paid a fee of 1% of the original $15 million, but your investment never exceeds $5 million, then effectively your fee wasn't 1%, in my hypothetical the, the, the fee was 3%. Uh, that doesn't address something that's a lawyer's concern or a question of concern for the um, uh, for the law committee. It's really a question for the investment advisory committee and the retirement board themselves. We merely make the observation in passing that, uh, that the way the fee is structured, it's, it's paid based upon the commitment and not paid based upon the amount that we're actually capital invested. In the end, the conclusion of the law committee was that these ambiguities certainly made us modestly uncomfortable, in part responded to by the uh, replies that were forwarded to you from Landmark. Um, those things, each of them are what they are. We found overall the investment to be in legal order, and we said, did so by a vote of 2-0. Um, I would just like to comment here that um, I raised these issues not out of concern because I always looked to the legal documentation as such um, to Mr. McLaughlin and all the good work, but these were all points raised in the documentation in Mr. McLaughlin's letter and its attachment to us, which I read and I always read. I think we're very fortunate to have a law department that does go through each of these investments and um, raises in its memorandum issues that we should all be considering when we're voting on this investment. So um, quite frankly, I'm not that clever, but I have um, read all Mr. McLaughlin's excellent work. And um, you know, I think that it's important that each of us um, read this, the, well, his work and the information that's provided to all of us and think about the you know, implications of these. But in terms of the legal order and what the law committee is, is supposed to do, um, the law committee did find that the documents are in legal order um, for the subscription agreement to be entered into. And I think that's a separate issue but a disparity between documentation um, and what is described is always important to understand. Thank you. For the discussion? Yes. Mr. Rimmer. Uh, this, is, this is not a law committee report, it's just my own personal observation. Uh, as I have done, um, uh, as everybody on this board knows, uh, frequently over the past several investments, um, I will be voting against this investment, not because I have criticism about the wisdom of this particular investment, but because uh, in, in my view, uh, I feel like our uh, commitment to private equity or alternative investments um, is becoming uh, too deep. Um, uh, we're, uh, according to the figures, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minarski, according to the figures from Mr. Minarski, um, if we're presently invested um, in, at 62 and two-thirds million dollars uh, presently funded, that's not committed, if we're committed for up to just shy of $110 million, and that does not include the Welsh Carlson Fund approved last time, and it doesn't include uh, landmark that we're approving perhaps tonight, um, that uh, if fully drawn down, we would be at over 28% of the entire portfolio of the retirement board invested in alternative investments. If I add in the new, uh, the Welsh Carlson and the new landmark, we would be at 36% invested in alternative investments, unregulated investments. Uh, and I, I understand the strategy. I, I understand uh, how bitter it is that we receive small returns on portfolios of investment and have to respond to that with very large sums that we pay out of taxpayers' dollars to support our pension. Nevertheless, to me, it seems imprudent to be that deeply invested in alternative investments. And so I will vote against it for that principle, but not because of opposition to this particular fund. Mr. Goldrick? So this landmark fund goes around to pension funds that have real estate equity 
funds that they want to get rid of. And they pay them a deep discount to take it off their hands. Uh, when they say that uh, they look into and see what is in these investments as opposed to investing in something and then subsequently they find things to invest in, <clears throat> it could be that they're looking at real dogs of investments in those portfolios. So they can turn around and give uh, City of San Antonio or whatever 40 cents on the dollar or 30 cents on the dollar or 60 cents on the dollar, deep discounts, and then they put it in this and hope that they're going to make a big return off of that at some point in the future. <clears throat> Given where we are on our private equity investments, this is a cautionary tale. These funds are locked in for years. We hope that they liquidate them over three or six years or begin to and we draw them down over time, but it's not necessarily true that that will happen. And this is the sort of fund that goes to funds like, uh, towns like ours, pension funds like ours, and says you're in a real dog or else you've made a mistake, you realize you have too much in private investment vehicles and you want to unload it. And guess what, they pay you cents on the dollar. So I agree that we are going way too fast into these private investment vehicles. And the fact that we are looking to buy into a fund which basically takes advantage of pension funds like ours that get overextended, I think we have one other fund like this in the portfolio, is a cautionary tale. And I, I don't think that we are, we should be doing this. I think we're moving far too fast. I think plain vanilla is what a pension fund like ours with our size is what we should be doing with lower fees too. Let me just ask a question really quick. Investment committee voted? Four to zero. Okay, retirement board voted? Five to zero. Further discussion? I am, I am happy to be the one voice, uh, the, the Cassandra here, uh, who as you know, uh, Cassandra was always proved right, although no one was listening to her. So I'm perfectly happy to be in that position. I guess I should have spoken louder. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, is there further discussion needed? Okay, I, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. All right. So 10 to 0. Boy, I hope you're not right. <laughs> okay, moving on to the next item. The Thainer Willerill Tax Credit Resolution. Um, who has this one? Mr. Norton, Mr. Minarski, or Mr. McLaughlin? Mr. McLaughlin. Good evening, welcome. Thank you for, thank you for joining us tonight. And by the way, I have the same question because I believe this is good. This item will, if we approve it, will go to the RTM. So yes. I want to make sure we're clear who's got this item and taking it to them. The, uh, good evening, uh, Gene McLaughlin, Assistant Town Attorney. Uh, I'm here uh, because we've, uh, at the urging uh, of the Nathaniel Witherell Board and the uh, committee that uh, was very instrumental in getting these historic tax credits, uh, research that approved, uh, we are in the uh, fortunate circumstance of actually uh, being on the verge of getting uh, uh, tax credits that the town can sell. It uh, appears to be to Northeast Utilities that uh, will be revenue coming into the town in order to uh, pay off the indebtedness uh, of the bonds. Um, this was a, uh, a project that was uh, researched uh, by the Nathaniel Witherell Board. They consulted with our bond council, uh, Robinson Cole, Cole uh, David Panico, and uh, they were able to um, uh, research several things. One was uh, some kind of a federal tax credit. I think that proved to be a little too complicated, and perhaps the, the title in Nathaniel Witherell would have had to be transferred, which was not uh, something that was that could be done. So they settled on this um, this application for state historic tax credits, and um, at the urging of Art Norton, uh, we wanted to get this uh, approved uh, by your board, since it is a financial matter on behalf of the town, and uh, get it um, on the agenda of the uh, representative town meeting, uh, which it is. Uh, it, it, uh, as of last Friday, 
the resolution uh, was placed uh, to the town clerk, along with uh, explanatory comments that the Nathaniel Wooden Rule uh, prepared about the history of how, how they got this. Um, what is being done here is apparently the, uh, the town has already approved, I think, in the budget that uh, 950000 will be returned that was borrowed from the town uh, for the financing of the project renew. And that uh, in the budget, um, I believe it was another two two and a half million or so, no, Peter? Two million one fifty-five. Two million one fifty-five was uh, pro was approved in this year's budget uh, to pay down the bonds. Uh, as far as uh, further use of the balance of the uh, four million four hundred ninety thousand nine hundred eighteen dollars, which would be the tax credits, it was the opinion of the bond council that uh, that had to be used uh, to pay down the indebtedness of the bonds and could not be unrestricted. This may have been somewhat contrary to what had been told to the controller early on by the State Historic Commission, but it is of the opinion of the council, our bond council, that it has to be used in that, in that regard. So uh, I think the balance of the uh, money will probably be uh, put into the budget, as I understand it, to, uh, next year to further pay down the uh, the indebtedness. The resolution uh, uh, basically ratifies everything that's been done to date in terms of the application uh, and allows the town uh, through the first selectment to uh, execute any documents that are required and to take any action that's necessary to approve the, the sale of the credits, which will apparently be to Northeast Utilities, and uh, that they be used, as I've explained, to uh, repay the uh, fund loan to the town and the principal and interest that's already been approved in the appropriation. So we do have some representatives from the Nathaniel Wither. I don't know if they want to speak or answer any questions, but that, that is it in a nutshell about what we're doing. As far as who will present this, um, um, we can discuss that further before it is on the call. At least we get the place and we okay. get the resolution and the explanos. Uh, uh, it might be uh, well since Nathaniel Weather was carried the heavy lifting here that they be able to make the presentation and get their credit uh, for the good work that they've done. So I don't know if you have any questions about it. Mr. Chairman, I, I, Mr. Norton, I'll make the motion that uh, four items to the resolution, and I will move that they be added for our consideration at this time. You want me to read the four items? Uh, is it? Is it the two pages in our? Yeah, it's it's, it's, our, a, yeah. it's our agenda package. Um, okay, so the items moved. Do I have a second? Second. Well, seconded by Mr. Finger. Uh, general discussion. Does anybody have any discussion on this? Uh, I, again, my concern is, and I see Mr. Solar out at there. This is going to have to be taken through the RTM to the. I'm sure it'll go to finance. It'll probably go to. Health and Human Services, my guess. I just want to make sure we're organized when it goes through there because this is, you know, sort of non-routine. Um, uh, you know, if if we can help, you know, we'll we'll help. Um, this is something we had been, you know, we we thank you. We we know we've been working on this all last budget. So, Ms. Kiernan? Mike, just quick question. Uh, Roland and I were talking about this the other day. Of the the total, we accounted for two and a half. In the current year budget, is that correct? Mm -hmm. and what do we What do we have left? What are you? You have the in the budget. It's two million one hundred fifty-five thousand. Okay. Nine hundred fifty thousand has to be returned to the capital non recurrent and it's listed in the resolution. Right. The balance is one million three hundred eighty-five thousand, which can be uh, used to offset the debt service for 2015-16. The debt service is going to be approximately two point one million dollars. So it's actually helping Nathaniel Witherall to balance their budget in 15-16. And Ms. Kiernan, I've already written that down into the fiscal year 16 budget. You have. Oh, I'm not surprised. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> I'm not going to let go of that. Okay. okay. Uh, Mr. Drake? Quick comment. Uh, you mentioned this is a state, state matter, state tax credits. You, you quickly touched upon the subject that federal wasn't available because it required change of title of the facility or something, just blue sky would 
If it were federal, would it be much larger? Is federal tax rates being higher than state tax rates? I mean, would it, this is $4 million. If it were federal, would it be 2 or 20 or? It'd be up to 30. Be up to 30 million. 30%. As opposed 30 percent to 30% of? As opposed to 25%. Okay. Not much, that much bigger. Okay. Thanks for the answer. No, I, I, Thanks, I would just like Parker. to add, we actually had a committee which included um, a couple members of this board that worked on um, a federal structure. And, um, you know, the withdrawal property, et cetera, would have had to have been transferred into a uh, special purpose entity. Um, it would have been very costly. Uh, there are many other risks, and the town chose not to proceed on that. So um, there was a lot of work done working with Nathaniel Witherall, um, the first selectman, et cetera, on, on a structured deal. And it, it was uh, just too complex to proceed. For the discussion? I'd like to add, it's probably the good work of Nathaniel Witherall that made this program available um, without having to go through this kind of structure at the state level. So um, congratulations to Nathaniel Witherall, and it's wonderful to get this money in to uh, help this effort. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? That carries 12-0-0. Mr. Finger? Chairman, I'd like to bring up a new item under new business, another item under new business. Oh, excuse me. I'd like to bring up a uh, another item under new business. An email was sent out to everybody this morning uh, by Mr. Minarski, followed by an email from Mr. Geiger later this afternoon, and you have copies of certain documents on your desk, and I believe there will be a motion. Okay. Um, so I, I have a motion to add an item on the agenda. Do I have a second? It's, it's not a motion to add an item on the agenda. Mr. Chairman. Okay. It's an item of new business, I believe, Mr. Chairman. Yes. But, mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want it to be added yes. as an agenda item, or do you want it as new business? How would you like I'm going to add it as a new business item as okay, well. I make a motion that, that um, we add as an agenda item uh, consideration of a resolution to amend an outstanding bond resolution. Do we have a second? Seconded. It's moved and seconded. There, I, I don't, if, unless anybody knows of any dissension, I don't see anything. Um, do I have anybody against adding an item? Okay, all those in favor of adding an item? Aye. 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 Opposed? That vote is 12-0. And Mr. Finger? Uh, I'll defer to uh, the person who will make the motion. Ms. Kiernan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So as Mr. Finger uh, explained, you have several documents that were sent to you and are also in front of you tonight. Uh, specifically, I want to refer you to uh, the one entitled Resolution Amending Outstanding Bond Resolutions to revise the maximum term of the bonds authorized thereby from five years to 20 years. There are a number of preliminary whereas clause, and I'll just read um, the amendment language itself. Now, therefore, be it resolved as follows. The bond resolutions are hereby amended to provide for the issuance of bonds maturing not later than the 20th year after their date in lieu of the fifth year after their date. And that is the motion. Second. Second moved by Ms. Kiernan, seconded by Mr. Finger. Discussion on the item? Um, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you and the rest of the board for allowing uh, this item to move forward this evening. Let me just review the resolution so uh, that all of us in the public uh, understand the context and the details. Currently, our bonding resolutions are passed with every budget by both the BET and the RTM. Each year in these resolutions, we authorize the sale of bands, one-year bands, and then five-year general obligation bonds to finance certain capital projects approved during the annual budget process. And the, one of the emails you received this afternoon gave you an example of uh, the type of budget resolution that we pass every year. The amendment that we just uh, moved and seconded tonight uh, was drafted by the town's bond council, Robinson and Cole and amends existing 
resolutions and authorizes the town to issue not only five-year general obligation bonds, but also bonds of any maturity up to 20 years with the controller determining which assets to finance at what maturity. That is the only change being proposed. This change applies to projects that have already been authorized and approved by both the BET and the RTM and are ready to be bonded. This resolution amendment will also have to be approved by the RTM for it to be in full force and effect for the financing that's going to take place, as you heard tonight, January 15th. Now, I have some further comments that uh, give a little more context and explain the timing, Mr. Chairman, uh, so I'm going to go through those. And the very first question you may be asking yourselves is why raise this amendment now? And I think the timing of the bonding amendment you see is very, very important, and there are several reasons why. Each January, as you heard, the town sells bans and bonds in the capital markets, and after the second year of bans under our debt policy, these obligations get rolled into five-year bonds. Those bans that are ready to be rolled into five-year bonds are expiring in mid-January, so we have a real deadline. We need to roll them into the appropriate maturities, as you heard on January 15th. So we as a finance board should be focused now on whether the markets and the potential terms and the authorizations are in order and appropriate for this very important financing. Uh, and as you all know, these resolutions are part of the closing documents for that financing, so they do need to be in order. The second reason on the timing is economic. Quantitative easing is now officially over. And the consensus among economists is that rates will likely rise in 2015. Rates have stayed at historic lows since the start of the recession. And this window of opportunity to lock down unusually low long-term rates will still close, will soon close. The impending rise in rates is also the consensus among municipalities and financial advisors around the rest of the state. I want you to know I attended the CCM, the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities Convention in October, and there were two really important takeaways for finance boards. Number one is that interest rates are going to go up in 2015. And number two, we should start getting ready for the Cadillac tax right now. Hmm. We have a responsibility, I think, to evaluate whether these historically low rates present uh, present an important opportunity for the town as it has for every other community in the state that's taken advantage of these unique conditions in the capital markets. Another element of the timing I'd like to bring to your attention. Last July, the Budget Overview Committee of the RTM published a memo with certain goals and certain thoughts about the upcoming year. It was a very thoughtful memo. And one of its four goals was to evaluate long-term borrowing. Another goal they stated for the town is the funding of our pension and OPEB liabilities, a new way of looking at that or a new strategy for that. And we should all acknowledge Mike Wasick from that committee who uh, has advocated for flexible financing and longer term financing previously, coupled with a review of our pension and OPEB liabilities. So there's certainly an acknowledgement, I think a new acknowledgement in the RTM that the timing of this discussion makes sense. And finally, I want to point to another reason why this timing makes sense. I think the interim appropriation last summer of $5 million to repair a critical sewer line brought this topic back into focus. This is a large project that will um, last many decades, but it's being financed over five years only by taxpayers in the sewer district. And I know there was much discussion about this at the time of that interim appropriation. So now that we're past the debate on the budget guidelines, I do think it's appropriate to take up this amendment in our bonding resolutions. So what exactly will this resolution do? And this is a critical question. All this resolution amendment does is give flexibility in the maturity of the general obligation bonds that we issue. These bonds could still be five years, or 10, or 15, or even three years, which some municipalities use as a maturity for certain IT projects. The BET has oversight over our controller and over this process, and our controller is very able to determine which maturities are appropriate given the needs of the town and given our capital planning and given the conditions in the capital markets. 
In recent discussions we've had with our controller, and he can certainly speak for himself on this, we've talked about laddering maturi maturities and an issuance that correspond with useful lives of the assets being financed. And in that scenario, bonds of various maturities would be issued together and we could get a blended rate of interest. And that's a common approach for municipalities of our size and complexity. When we have the flexibility to bond at longer terms, we do lower the debt service that taxpayers face every year and we need to point that out. And what I'd like to do just to help illustrate that is to pass out a spreadsheet um, that goes right to that point. I have two going this direction and a bunch going this way. Thank you, Art. So just as an example, and we've talked about this previously, this is not a, a new example. The handout illustrates five-year versus 20-year financing to fund about 20 million in capital projects. And you can see that the debt service that taxpayers pay each year is substantially less with five-year bonding. In year one, five-year financing is um, about 4.2 million in debt service and versus 1.5 million with 20-year financing. So it is less each year with 20-year financing. So we have 2.7 million more in cash on hand in year one, and you'll see that cash differential a little further down on the spreadsheet. And that accumulates over time. So by year five, we have over 13 million more in cash on hand. And we were still able to finance $20 million, a $20 million capital project. So we should ask ourselves, what do we do with that cash? How can we create more value for the taxpayer with that cash? And we have a number of options. First, we can certainly ease the burden on taxpayers and use some of this cash to buy down the mill rate, specifically, in my view, the capital tax levy which in fiscal 16 is projected to grow faster than health care, and we talked about this last month. And we've discussed this, Mr. Um, Goldrick has raised it, Mr. Huffman, many of us have raised this and discussed this numerous times in the past, most recently during the guidelines debate. What else might we do with this cash? We could also use this cash to start chipping away at the approximately 200 million in off-balance sheet unfunded liabilities that the town has between its pension system and its OPEB trust, trust obligations. We don't have any special strategy as a finance board to deal with this issue, other than the ongoing oversight of the retirement board and the OPEB trustees, and we should consider using some of this cash available to bring down these liabilities. Let me also emphasize what this resolution amendment does not do. This resolution amendment does not authorize the issuance of additional debt. That is very clear in the language, and the BET and RTM retain that authority when they pass budgets and resolutions every year. This amendment merely allows flexibility and maturities, not the issuance of additional debt, and sometimes that gets flipped. In addition, this resolution amendment does not create a slippery slope toward more outstanding debt. Again, the BET and the RTM retain the authority to approve or not approve capital projects, and we retain the fiscal authority to decide to either pay for capital with either cash or by borrowing. Again, this resolution amendment simply provides flexibility on the maturities of the debt the town issues and not the amount of debt. And I will mention finally that this amendment will have zero impact on our credit rating. Our AAA credit rating is dependent mostly on the town's extraordinary tax base and the ability of its citizens to consistently pay their taxes. Credit rating agencies will not change their ratings if we pass this resolution amendment. Now, I'm not going to go through the many arguments that we uh, or discussions we have had in the past about why we should finance at various maturities, but I just want to highlight the risks that we face. And there are material risks if we don't have this kind of flexibility in our toolbox. The first risk is interest rate risk. Whenever we embark on a band band five year bond financing strategy, we're betting 
that in two years we can lock in a five-year bond rate that's favorable. That's a very rigid system. Again, the consensus is that interest rates are going to rise in 2015 and certainly in two years. Right now, again, we are in a period of historic low interest rates and we should reduce our exposure to this interest rate risk. The second risk is a lack of diversification in our bond portfolio. By only financing in two markets along the yield curve, which are the ban and five-year bond markets, we take on risks that we don't need to take on as a AAA municipality. And we heard that from one of the financial advisors that came to visit us uh, a year or so ago. Another element I'd like to, to point out for the benefit of the public tonight and that is the analysis that is done on this spreadsheet. When we think about the maturities that we might consider bonding at, we have to do a net present value analysis. And you will see on that sheet that I have done that, and I've tried to do this in a very, very fair way and look at three different discount rates. And the first one is the discount rate we use in our pension system, 7.25 currently. And you will see using that analysis that it is cheaper in the end to bond at 20 years than at five years. The second rate I used was the rate we got before the recession, which was 3.4% um, on our five-year bonds. And that uh, also shows on a net present value basis that 20-year financing is cheaper than five-year financing. That discount rate should reflect our historic cost of capital. Now, just to be fair, and for illustration purposes, I tried it at 2 percent and, and the, the results flip, but they're still close. Um, but I don't think you'll find anybody who says that when you model this, 2 percent is the right dis discount rate. It should be higher. One last item I'd like to point out, and, and thank you for your patience is the last set of numbers on the sheet that I handed out, which are the transaction costs that we incur every time we go to market. And when we bond over five years only, we're going to naturally incur these costs more often than if we bond longer. And so with Peter and Roland's help, I tried to strip out the costs associated with financing of the bands last January. And you'll see that financing uh, the bonds that we sold last January cost over $200,000 in transaction costs. We're paying rating agencies, we're paying lawyers, financial advisors, and we also pay the underwriters. Um, and, and this is a material amount of money. This is uh, and money that will inflate over time to at some measure. So I would ask you to please think about allowing for flexibility in our approach to financing capital assets and please uh, think about voting for this resolution amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Norton, you had your hand up? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I would like to speak on this item because I think the proposal we've just heard is the wrong motion at the wrong time for the wrong reasons. The protracted discussion that we've received from um, the, this board on the town debt policy has to be a result of our propensity to either ignore or to deny the recent history, financial history of the town of Greenwich. As most of you know, I spent uh, more than 28 years on the RTM, most in a leadership capacity. Approximately 80 years ago, the RTM was organized to, the RTM was organized to succeed the town meeting as a form of government, and its creation was partially initiated to address the then debt situation and the inherent problems that debt can impose. Thus, until recent years, the town had implemented only an internal financing model, with the exception of sewer debt, which is imposed on specific beneficiaries of the sewer system. Beginning with the property purchase at King Street, and to house a combination fire station and GEMS facility, the town of Greenwich began to change its position to eschew external financing nine years ago to satisfy both cash flow needs for capital expenditures and to address the expanding capital improvement program, we implemented the current debt model with external financing for non-self-sustaining capital projects with financing limited to five-year notes and bans. Bans can only be issued uh, for a period of up to one year. 
This policy change is, is expressed completely in our current debt policy, which by agreement we will review every two years. And it is my position that it is not prudent to amend the model, especially at this time. Amending the model will add to the total cost of every capital project, and I do not understand why we want to impact and add additional burden on the taxpayers. Again, we hear from our colleagues the putative benefits of long-term debt repayment model. And we're even presented with an opinion from Goldman Sachs, which is an outstanding marketing and sales organization that is very successful with their finance structure models. We do not need to pay investment banking, underwriting, management, or organizational fees, and we do not currently pay any of the above, much less selling commission to finance our capital needs. Any financial program that has a other than the one in which we currently have, we will face all those external costs. The current finance model implemented in 2007 is to serve the capital improvement plan, which was originally a 10-year plan, has since been extended to 15 years. This model is very cost efficient, cost effective, satisfies current tax law, and allows us to borrow what is needed. Since we receive no depreciation credit, cash flow is defined for other corporate entities does not accrue to us. An ancillary argument to support long debt service is the project life of individual projects. And I believe that that's a specious argument because it ignores maintenance needs, <clears throat> change of use, technolo technological changes, and general market conditions for any town facility. Life expectancy of a physical asset is a function of current and projected use. Any argument that the proposed change will allow for more capital projects fails to recognize the infrastructure capital limitations of the, of the town of Greenwich bureaucracy. The building department, engineering department, sewer departments, fire marshal's office, purchasing department, and the regulatory departments are constrained current, con currently. And to expand them will require much in skill level and cost. As an example, there were more than 800 inspections for Project Renew, and MISA will experience similar demands. I posit that there is a lack of popular demand for a change in the current policy. I posit further that the use of credit by individuals, business enterprises, governments, all activities should be a function of specifically identified and manageable needs, and not the amount that can be borrowed and financed. Our AAA tax credit is a function, as was just mentioned by the proponent of, of this proposal, as a result of our ability to, to meet our obligations and the size of our uh, tax base. Our current rating should not drive how much we can borrow. Rather, it should be evidence of how well we manage our business, which is the financing of the town's capital needs. I will not support any change to extend our financing model for this project or any project <clears throat> lacks a revenue stream. Thank you. Mr. Finger. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Ms. Kiernan, for covering, I think, uh, the merits of this motion very, very well, very extensively, and very comprehensively. Um, Mr. Norton, in all due respect, I don't think you were you were listening carefully to uh, Mrs. Kiernan's presentation in a number of areas. One, you made reference to we don't need uh, sales entities like Goldman Sachs and pay external costs. As was pointed out, we pay these fees every time we go out to the markets. And Ms. Kiernan, on the handout that she provided everybody, um, stripping out the bands indicates that we pay over $200,000 in those fees. So whether we're five years, 10 years, 15 years, or 20 years, there are fees and costs associated with going out to the financial markets in bonding. With regard to, to your comment about life expectancy is a specious argument, um, you might want to take that up with the IRS, who allows for uh, depreciation on useful life and life expectancy. But the one item that I would like to hone in on, and it's often used as the reason why we should not do long-term bonding, is that many people on this board and elsewhere assume that if we do long-term bonding and those who advocate long-term bonding, 
that we are also advocating that the town take on additional borrowings. As Ms. Karen, Ms. Karen pointed out, that is not what this resolution is calling for. It is just giving flexibility to, to uh, on, the ter on the maturities of bonds. There is nothing in here that talks about additional borrowings. There's nothing here about talking about taking on new projects, as was again pointed out by Ms. Karen in, in her um, comments on the support of, the, of her motion, was that this board and the RTM have the ultimate say on whether a project is done and not done. It's not determined by whether we do bonds for five years, 10 years, 15 years, or 20 years. This board and the RTM makes those decisions. So I heard your comments and I, I've heard those, those arguments made oftentimes. Um, I, 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 again, you know, I, I don't agree with many or any of them. And I'd just like to conclude my comments with a quote from uh, George Bernard Shaw, and that is that progress is impossible without change, and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. Thank you. Mr. Goldberg. Um, yeah, I'm not an attorney. I've never been paid by the hour, so I'll, I'll be brief. <clears throat> you know, I, I, I'm constantly amazed that the institutional memory uh, of the Greenwich government seems to suggest that 1929 was yesterday. <clears throat> this is the 21st century. Things have changed. Uh, and what was appropriate for 1930 is not necessarily appropriate for 2014. Now, Mr. Norton mentioned burdening taxpayers um, with higher costs. We can borrow at two and an eighth percent today. Uh, does anyone think that three years from now or four years from now that interest rate's not going to be 200, 250 basis points higher? In, uh, inflation higher than two and an eighth percent? That means that we are cap able to borrow today at what will be negative real interest rates, perhaps 36 or 48 months from now or even five or 10 years from now. This is common sense. Uh, I would urge you all to call up your Republican first selectman buddies in Connecticut, ask them what they do. They all do this. It's common sense. I would just also um, talk about the, the credit rating. And first, let me, let's, let's go to definitions here. If you are lengthening maturities, you are keeping debt on the books for longer. So with the same number and amount of projects, your debt levels will go up. But let's be clear here, just like anyone who has a mortgage does this calculation. What is your income? Uh, what is your debt service that you can uh, uh, safely service? We are at about one third of a percent uh, in terms of our debt burden. The median, just the median for Connecticut AAA municipalities is 1.3%. So the model that uh, Mr. Huffman and I did shows over four years from now still being at half of that debt burden. So this is not becoming Detroit. Uh, I hope you were all listening to this. The, the next step for taking on long-term maturities is not bankruptcy. Um, and I would point out that already 10% of the budget for this year is the capital uh, t tax levy, almost none of which is interest expense. It is either cash or the early repayment of principal. And if we were to take on uh, long-term bonding here, we would still be locking in either virtually zero real interest rates or negative real interest rates in the future. So if you want to talk about burdening the taxpayers, think about where these rates will be three or four years from now when you want to go out and refinance the entire amount of our uh, uh, financing needs all at the higher end because we have not locked in lower rates at this point. Just in terms of the AAA rating, remember what it entails. 
One is, uh, well, there are lots of things in there, but the tax rate, the property tax rate is another one. By doing this, you're reducing uh, property taxes going forward. You are keep, keeping them much lower than if we were to finance these with short-term money. As I would point out, uh, in Mr. Johnson's uh, budget guidelines, he has a $3 million increase for this financing in January. Uh, and our model, virtually the same financing that's going out January 15th with flexible financing has a $3 million reduction for taxpayers. That's a $6 million difference. So I don't understand where this notion comes through that we are going to burden the taxpayer with higher costs when we're actually reducing them, locking in what are perhaps zero if not negative real interest rates. This is common sense. Everyone does this, and it's just a matter of time when you come around to this. But the bottom line tonight is save taxpayers $6 million in January. Mr. Huffman. We've talked about these uh, issues um, over and over, but I think it just needs to be recalled that, first of all, what's been proposed in this resolution is sound financial planning. That underlies it. It is the appropriate borrowing period made available for long-term capital assets as we need them, and it will permit the town to meet more of its needs for maintaining its infrastructure and for uh, having the kind of quality of facilities that the people of this town should have and will want to have. And finally, the major difference <clears throat> that is so noticeable about using short-term debt for major projects versus long-term debt is that it's very unfair to today's taxpayers. It's unfair that they pay in a matter of a few, a few years, up to say five years, for a project that will have useful life and be in service for the people of this town for 20, 30, 50, 70 years. It's simply unfair in all regards that that is imposed upon our current taxpayers. And I would support this resolution. Uh, I think this is the right answer for this town to take. Thank you. Mr. Ms. Weisler. Um, I oppose the proposed motion for two key reasons. First, financing with longer-term 20-year debt will make the all-in cost of the project more expensive. That's because, as we all know, interest rates for longer-term debt are typically higher than for shorter-term debt, and because the interest costs would be incurred over an additional 15 years. If we look at the interest rates at which Greenwich has borrowed since 2010, the interest rate for 20-year debt has been about 2% higher on average than that for five-year debt. I don't see any valid argument for incurring these higher rates and costs for an additional 15 years. Second, our debt policy provides a necessary finance fiscal discipline. Under the current policy, we have been able to maintain our infrastructure while funding important upgrades such as Central Fire and MISA. However, with a more liberal debt policy, I think the temptation, I realize people are ruling this out tonight, but I think there's a strong temptation would be to fund the nice to have in addition to the need to have projects. Mr. Blakely. Uh, I had not been proposing to speak, Mr. Chairman, because uh, all, all the correct arguments have been made, I believe, by my uh, colleagues on our side of the aisle. Uh, however, I, I'm prompted to by Ms. Weisler's uh, comments just now. Uh, the only way to look at this from a financial professional point of view is the net present value, and uh, uh, Ms. Kinnan has set that out uh, ably. Net present value terms <coughs> using an appropriate discount rate uh, the cost is lower, period. Almost as the second point, uh, if there's any thought that uh, longer-term financing could give rise to um, opening the spigot and that this town wanting to spend more on projects, the simple answer to that, uh, as with anything you don't want on the television, is to turn it off, to say no. Um, so I, I reject both of um, uh, my colleagues' arguments. Thank you, Mr. Drake, and then Mr. Raymer. Uh, you know, 
Long-term borrowing can't be unlinked from long-term spending. You know, greater duration, it just sounds innocuous and it sounds reasonable. But longer duration inevitably leads to larger and larger amounts borrowed. To change duration without reaffirming our taxpayer-friendly limit on borrowing is to have the easy half of the discussion while postponing the more important half. The BET owes it to the taxpayers to face and not avoid the real decision, which is how much of a debt burden is the taxpayer compelled to pay. You know, Greenwich has a debt level which is admirably low, and the low debt and moderate taxes are mutually reinforcing policies. They go together. And the intention to lengthen maturities is an attempt to separate the inseparable. We insist on full disclosure to people. If we borrow more now, you will be taxed more later, not less, more. Why are we largely free of debt compared to other governments? Why do we have moderate taxes in this town? Well, because prior administrations, essentially all from the Republican Party, declined to choose seductive but dangerous borrowing. And are we saying that since the preceding boards had the restraint and discipline to respect the taxpayer that we don't need to? That would be a reckless and selfish policy change. The present approach has been successful. We have a moderate level of debt, and our goal should not be to lengthen and increase it, but reduce it. But let's look at our present situation with a little perspective and detachment. Our town today probably has a billion dollars of assets. Our parks alone are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And our school buildings and facilities, these are long-lived assets that have lasted decades and will last decades more. Did those who acquired these assets in previous decades burden you and us with the corresponding billion dollars of debt? No. And are we to say that here in 2014, the previous policies of discipline and careful financial management, they were short-sighted? Are we really much more clever today than those who preceded us? That wouldn't be fair. The right step is to preserve the discipline that has served our town so well. Let's have the maturity to make the hard decisions and treat those who follow us with the respect that our predecessors showed us. The issue isn't maturities. Even though it's not on this piece of paper, it's overall debt level. The Republicans will be voting for a cleaner, simpler, safer, more taxpayer-friendly, more citizen-friendly approach. Mr. Raymer, Ms. Tarkington will be next. This would be <clears throat> a great subject to depoliticize over the months that come. Uh, uh, I've heard the chairman on occasion liken the operation of the town to the traveling of a super tanker where you turn the wheel and five miles later it begins to reveal a discernible movement to one side or the other. Uh, and I think the operation of the town is that way. Uh, this town has made changes at times in the way that it finances its capital projects, but those changes have been made when they've been embraced and proposed by the majority party. I don't like to sit here and listen to people refer to one party or another or the aisle. I honestly think that there is a wisdom in uh, having the latitude to have varying maturities on bonds. I will certainly vote in favor of this proposition. I think I know how the vote's going to go tonight, but I want the dialogue at this point not to be over. I hope that reasonable minds will debate, will debate among this group the points that are wise and the points that are not wise and be open and flexible. Do note for these future conversations that nobody has asked concession to the fact that there needs to be more capital projects. A majority party will always be able to veto a, a project that they wish not to do. 
the majority party will always be able to govern the maturity of the bond issuance on that. So there is no threat or danger here in this proposition to have more projects imposed on the majority party or to have longer maturities imposed on the majority party. All you've been asked to do at this point is to remove the rigid constraint and say that you're open-minded. We'll take the vote tonight. The vote will be whatever the vote is tonight. And then I would like to embark upon a long, quiet process among the group of us in which we talk about things that are wise, depoliticize them, be open to things so that we're not voting based upon where the aisle is situated. We're voting instead on our perception of what makes dollar sense to this town. Ms. Turkington? Yes. Uh, the town finances over a longer term than may be recognized in discussions about the town's debt policy model. Rather than consider over how many years a project should be financed, the following is a comparison of where the town's capital project financing has been and its impact on taxation on the town's taxpayers and contrast this scenario with the current method of financing and its impact. MISA, the high school auditorium project, is used to make the comparison. The first appropriation for design of MISA was approved in fiscal year 2007-2008. The assumption is that there will be no additional appropriations after the latest approved in the current fiscal year, and the total cost of the project is $46.1 million. As you heard earlier this evening, the MISA project is approximately 53% complete. Under the town's previous and traditional pay-as-you-go method of financing, appropriations are taxed equally over a five-year period, with the fiscal year of the appropriation being the first year of taxation. Under pay-as-you-go, MISA would be taxed over an 11-year period. By the current fiscal year, fiscal year 2014-15, $31.4 million would have been taxed. The taxpayer would have paid for 68% of the $46.1 million MISA project at this time. That's currently. Under the town's current modified pay-as-you-go method of financing for most capital projects, bans or notes are issued for two years in the later of the fiscal year for the approved appropriation or the fiscal year for the expenditure. In the third year, a five-year bond with five equal annual principal payments is issued to refund the notes, and in the fourth year, the first bond payment is made. The last payment year is the eighth year after the initial note issuance. Under modified pay-as-you-go, MISA would be taxed over a 16-year period, including the current fiscal year, only $5.4 million has been taxed, which is 12% of the MISA project. This is in contrast to pay-as-you-go having taxed a multiple of almost six times that amount during the same period. In the MISA example, modified pay-as-you-go extends the financing period by five years. It greatly pushes out the cost of the project to future taxing periods. And I haven't gone into the interest rate analysis here because I think this is complex enough. Moving from pay-as-you-go to modified pay-as-you-go accomplished two things. It extended the initial taxation of a project from the first year to the fourth year, and it deferred any financing of the project until cash flow is needed for the project. Because this has permitted the approval of many additional projects, and with project management governance remaining unchanged, it may have put a strain on management, whether paid or volunteer, of these capital projects. In summary, the cur current modified pay-as-you-go policy with five-year bonding should remain in force. Mr. Johnson. A lot has been said tonight. Um, I agree with 
about half of what has been said, I guess, of the people. Um, don't need to uh, really add uh, that much more to it other than I, I do want to emphasize that over the last 10 years, we've appropriated $595 million. A lot has been accomplished in this town. A lot of things have been built. This all under our, most of it is under our current debt policy and procedures. I think it's worked pretty well. Um, I also kind of wonder over the next 20 years, by when you look at some of these models, it assumes interest rates would be going higher and higher. What if they come down? Wouldn't that perhaps limit us a little bit as to what we could, what our total expenses are? Overall, I think our, our current policy is fine. I think it's worked, and I think we've accomplished a lot. Um, and I am not going to be voting in favor of this motion. That is everybody except myself. Mr. Goldrick, you had your hand up for a second, go. <clears throat> you know, I, I'm surprised to hear that um, members here think that we've been responsible and that this policy has worked well for us. Remember what happened in 2007. We had no debt in this town, but all of a sudden, the, all of the birds came home to roost. We had to rebuild the police station, uh, the central fire station. Uh, Hamilton Avenue was in such bad shape it had to be torn down and rebuilt. We've had how many breaks in the sewer line which has been neglected, so we're under two consent decrees on that. And um, the notion back then in 2007 when this five-year financing model was brought in was that all we had to do was finance just a few projects, a few things had to be rebuilt, a few things renovated, and then we could get past it, and we could pay it all off, and we would be back to where we were, basically not spend, spending anything in, in capital uh, projects, having no debt, and we could return to that, uh, that those halcyon days. <clears throat> But in fact, what had happened was we're paying the price now for decades of neglect of our infrastructure. Eastern Greenwich Civic Center, we can't even repair it because it's in such bad shape. Uh, the, uh, the municipal pool needs to be shut down. Dorothy Hamill is in miserable shape. We've got New Lebanon School, which has to be rebuilt. And this is just, uh, remember, um, I wish Ms. Ms. Kiernan had been there for the August meeting. We would have had three uh, votes for reason in financing over 20 years a, a fix in the sewer line, which is going to last between 50 and 70 years, instead of increasing the sewer assessment by 17% for the next five years. <clears throat> So we're not going to get back to that time when we could invest nothing and maintain nothing. Uh, we're paying the price now. We've got a long way to go. The other thing to keep in mind here when we're talking about <clears throat> being responsible is look at our property values because people who are paying this kind of price for their house wants to be in a place with a lot of nice-to-haves and not just need to haves. We're competing with Darien and New Canaan and Westport, and as the financial industry moves out of Midtown, there are a lot more people that can live farther and farther out from the city. <clears throat> and, and let's you know, be honest here, the, the whole point is that we should not be putting the burden to pay for decades of neglect in maintaining our infrastructure on people who are here right now for just a few years. It makes sense. It's common financial theory to spread these costs over people going forward. And the interest rate is virtually nothing today. If it goes up, uh, we are going to be locked in at this point in time. If 10 years from now the interest rates are 7%, we can go back to another form. Uh, we can use bans, we could uh, put off uh, new financing, or we could put an, a call option in there. Heaven forbid, right? And we can get those costs down over time. So again, there should be no debate here. This, this is simple. Uh, and this is what's good for the taxpayers. Remember that $6 million in January. And uh, I think, it, I can't see how anyone would vote against this. Ms. Kiernan? I just want to clarify two points, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, again, for allowing this discussion to move forward. We do already bond long-term. I want to make sure the public understands this. Nathaniel Witherell was bonded at 20 years after one year of bans, not two years of bans, which is what the debt policy requires. And I also want to mention our sewer improvement debt. That's 20 years. 
And the biggest liability, the biggest debt we have is the unfunded liability in our pension fund. You should take a hard look at the Boomer Shine report that we just recently received. We're funding that long term also. So I want the public to be clear, we do this already and there has been no automatic, dramatic, uh, coupled increase in debt when we started doing all of that and as we continue to do all of that. And one other point of uh, clarification, Mr. Johnson raised a very, very good question, well, what if interest rates come down? Well, that's exactly what's anticipated in the motion before you. There is flexibility in the motion before you to deal with any market condition and we should have that flexibility because we, we're not an island. We are subject to the markets. We are subject to the larger economy and we can't run away from that. So thank you. Um, Robert Trules, Mr. Rambers got me reading and I'm supposed to not get involved in the debate until the end and then we have our rules. Well, let me, give me a little patience here. So right here I have in front of me the actual Robinson, who is this from, Peter Minarski? Robinson and Cole. This is an actual borrowing that Peter is going to execute in January. It's the next tranche on MISA. Uh, total payback, $8.7 million. Uh, that's got a, a rate of 1.36 on the borrowing. And if you extend this out with a 2.45%, which is an actual quote, right? You just got this quote. The project goes to 10. percent Oh, five, eight million. So it's about $1.2 million difference on this $8 million borrowing in cost. And if I look at the handout we have tonight and I do some quick math on this hypothetical 20 year, I'm sorry, if I look at this hypothetical $20 million borrowing, uh, the way we do things is the project is going to cost uh, $4 million to the penny more for payback. That's just some factual numbers there. So let me let me take a stab at this, because obviously when I when I heard about this coming, and obviously I didn't put it on the agenda because it wasn't ready at the time of the agenda, and, and I had been speaking to several people about this, let's talk about extending the town's borrowing terms for a minute. I'm sitting here with some people that have served in this government for far longer than I have, and I read the paper lately and I see that we have to change. Now we need a mayor, we need a town council, and the RTM's no good, and the way we finance the town for all these years, that's no good. So. I, I'm not sure how I'm going to be able to handle this. I'll probably sleep at night after my Oreos, but I'm going to give it a stab. So the debt policy that we have right now is about a year and a half. It's not quite. We, we reaffirmed it about a little less than a year and a half ago. And prior to that was the first time we ever had one, two years prior to that. So the original plan for the debt policy, which I hadn't heard brought up yet, is to allow us to throttle our capital. And we did just that in 08. We throttled back very quick. We didn't have a lot of commitments to our prior debt, so what we did was we throttled back. Is that good or not? I, I don't know. We were, some of us were here when we did it, and that's what we did. I hear people say now is the time to take care of a low interest rates. I fully agree. I don't care if we're borrowing 20 years or five years. The rates are low. We should take advantage of them. So I, I think that that just goes back to, the again, the total cost of the project. To change our current plan right now, what we have before us, if you take and you add the total outstanding debt by adding the interest, we've actually would, we'd have to go back and change our, our debt policy right now because we would have exceeded it. Uh, well, we would probably exceed it in January, I should say that, to be accurate. So the purpose for the change, I, I'm, I'm looking for the purpose. So we want to reduce the cap, capital tax levy today. I'm pretty sure I heard that, but we're extending it tomorrow. Wait a minute, hold on a minute. It increases tomorrow's capital tax levy. And, and here's, you know, this is really gonna come down to old school or new school. Tomorrow's generation, you heard it say, do we want tomorrow's generation to pay for what we have? One of my biggest mentors in the Board of Estimate Taxation, and by the way, I, I know he's not a Republican, said, you know, we, wanna, we don't wanna lock the vision of tomorrow. You know, if we had to buy Todd's point today, you know, how would we do it? But look, you know, it took the RTM four, three times to buy it in 1945, but, it's the, it's the biggest, treasure, biggest treasure on the East Coast. We commit our borrowings to meet cash flow needs. We also borrow in trenches, and we also need to remember in our borrowings, we have to avoid arbitrage, and that's IRS rules. Challenge we have here is how many of us can sit here and honestly say that we decided to do something and we didn't run into a delay. MISA had its delay. Let's pick the projects. The firehouse had its delay. The Board of Ed projects is usually a delay because we want to wait till school gets. There's always a reason. So we have to be very careful because 
Peter had explained to me that we have six months to commit a percentage, another six months to commit, and by the 18th month, I think we have to fully commit what we borrow or repurpose it. So if you think about if we're going to do multi-level borrowings where, and, and if I may, Ms. Kiernan, we're going to borrow, say, for roads for three years, we're going to borrow something else, it would be very difficult for Peter to have to repurpose bonding if we ran into a delay. It, it's, it's not the, it, we've had to do it already once or twice and it's just extra work. We also borrow on, on our large capital projects for more what I think is 10 or 12 years. Okay, Mies is gonna exceed that. Not seven, as some people think, and not 20, as suggested here. I think I heard in a meeting with a, a guest we had that the actual outstanding debt in the state of Connecticut for municipalities is 12 years. That's what they're running. So what do we hear? We hear other communities are doing this. I heard the saying tonight, Everyone is doing it. I've heard that before, but I was a lot younger, I think. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but I'll say this to you. Show me a community that's not envious of our financial condition and fiscal stewardship. Show me one. I mean, we're, I'm standing in front of the RTM wide. New Canaan's raises their taxes 7%. 7% tax rate increase in our town. We, we might have a revolt. We can easily, I've heard we can easily handle $5 million in debt with a revised payment schedule and term. Uh, 500 million, I'm sorry. Uh, five billion was it? Uh, there's a couple zeros. I, I have no comment on that. Um, I, I really don't. We hear that we're not prudent. I've heard the word prudent. The town of Greenwich isn't prudent or not. The town of Greenwich is a community that makes decisions on what they would want. It's not prudent to have a neighborhood school system with two schools at half occupancy. It's not prudent to run ferry boats to islands, to have a town nursing home. Government should, as Alice Melly would say to me, is to provide the mandated service, public safety, DPW, et cetera. We're not, it's not that we're prudent or not. We're a community that we do what we want to do. And we, we've done that and we've been very successful at it. The town wants this, I've heard this. And I've heard about the letter from the RTM. Well, if the town wants this, they should go back, and I encourage all the members here, to go back to the letter to from Mr. Walco, chair of this board, on 10-3-2008 to the RTM where he actually explained all of the options to borrowing when we were getting into it at that time. He actually gave them a full presentation. It's on the web. It's part of our minutes. And the RTM had a full crack at it at that time. And at that time, the RTM could have easily said, change the 5 to a 20 in the bonding resolution, and they could have done it. So when people say that the town wants to do it, I'm not so sure that they really haven't had that, uh, that answered before. We did 20 year borrowing for Nathaniel Witherell. So let's talk about Nathaniel Witherell. So my 95 year old aunt breaks her leg and I can't get her in Nathaniel Witherell because they're so busy. We did something right there. But getting back to Nathaniel Witherell, the reason Nathaniel Witherell was done is because we actually had plans of putting it in a standalone entity. We actually wanted the revenues to be able to cover it, sort of a, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, a, a revenue bond. So that was the reason we did that. We all voted for it because it was a great decision at that time. It wasn't a policy. It was a decision before us at the time. So as I, as I look at this, here, here's, what I, here's what I, some real thoughts on this. Because I, I heard Mr. Raymer say some stuff, and I'll probably touch that. I believe we, the BET, we need to focus more on delivering our governmental service in the most economic manner. Instead of arguing about how we save cost on financing, we should look at revenues, we should look at a lot of things which we've been talk, talking about. This is a rerun, this story. I've watched this episode before, the BET. Click, I've watched it before. We talked about it last month. We talked about it during the budget. We talked about it when we did debt policy. What's next month gonna be? I'm not sure yet, but it, we, we need to follow process. For, for those of you who know me, I, I follow process. We're, we're less than three or four months from uh, a debt policy committee. Four of us will be serving on that. And we all know that we, we have areas that we could really have a good impact on town revenues. An example, because we do wonderful things we focus. Look at this HR system as an example, okay? Yes, it's good. it has some hurdles, but those were really positive things that we did. There are some people who choose to be negative about that particular item as an example, but it, the town has done some wonderful things. I voted supporting the item, the item tonight to the agenda. I call it professional courtesy. I don't think the board should ever go over an item ever without having homework done ahead of time. So we did have some time. But I do believe this is, uh, Mr. Raymer, I think you hit it right on the nose. 
I think this has become a central political issue. I was in the election last time for the municipal elections, and I heard about the Goldman Sachs visitor, and I've heard this, and I, and I believe it'll be the subject for the next upcoming political elections in the town. It shouldn't be. It should be a decision based on the town. Uh, I won't support this because th there's just no need to add that kind of capital expense on an $8 million borrowing to add 1.2 or to add 4 million when we do 20. If we went back in time and, and looked at some of the interest rates even across the board, we would, have, we would have had an extra $32 million of expenses in the last 10 years in borrowing costs. Now, I've heard the present value of money. Present value of money means, in my house, it means something different, but for, for the real, real sake of the conversation, $32 million more since some of us have been on the BET, just in interest charges. That's a real number. That, we can debate any way you want to debate it, but that's exactly what we would have spent more in the last 10 years. And, and I, I just don't support that. I, I stick to my words. I think we as a board are a fantastic board, different ideas, different philosophies, but I think we should be focusing on the, the budget as a whole. This is something that just keeps coming back. I could just see if we did variable borrowing, I'll use that term, the next conversation would be, I want to borrow on roads for only three years because they don't last as long because there's not as much oil in the blacktop and some people might want to vote six years to on roads and it, it'll just move, it, it'll, it's the shell game, it'll just move the conversation. So I, I, do, not, I do not plan on um, supporting this or, or breaking a tie in favor of it or anything like that. So thank you very much. Anything else? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. Six six, as I understand it. Do I need to verify that? Okay. Okay. Moving on. I have nothing under old business. Uh, minutes. BET. October twentieth. Was everybody here? I move that we approve the minutes. Do I have a second? second motion. Moved by Ms. Tarkenden, seconded by Mr. Raymer. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstaining. Twelve zero zero. Uh, Mr. Drake, do you have anything? No, nothing to add. Mr. Norton? No, sir. How's your wife? She's well. I, I'm telling you that lady's got DNA. Wow. Uh, under Chairman's Report, I just have a few quick things. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Reamer and Ms. Weisler for District 5. Um, they attended the RTM District on firefighting. Um, and I, I thank you for your time. I, I did attend with them, but I thought they did a, a wonderful job. It's, it's pretty interesting to read the faces. I think that's going to be a, a running dialogue for probably six months anyway. I thank you for doing that. Uh, next month, as I had brought up, um, Mr. Finger, you can help me on this if you'd like, is some type of interim appropriation for fund balance towards OPEB or pension. Um, anybody's got any thoughts on that, please send me an email, send me something, please, please, please. So I, I need that. Um, that's something we had decided to, uh, to do there. And then I, our, our next one is BET elections. Um, as you know, BET elections, to change any authority, makeup, election process of the BET, needs seven members of the BET to vote in the affirmative for a change. And then it goes to the RTM and onto a referendum. Uh, I've dug out all the material from back in, this one is dated March 5th, 04. And it's got four or five separate proposals. Um, I'll be working on sending that, Mr. Raymer. That'll be likely coming your way. Um, again, I think that, you know, so we're very clear the charter provision on that is that seven members have to vote to change any of our authority or election process. Other than that, um, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. That season is, that, that season is here. Mr. Blankley? Mr. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you.